Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I hope you're all keeping your miles up for the uh, Wenshi Hospital. I'm sure Adam and Pam are doing plenty of walking in America. If you're visiting with us, we're delighted you're here and we want to say hello to you later. So maybe you would hang about and, and speak to us personally so that we can say hello properly. There'll be tea and coffee as usual in the restaurant after the service this morning. And you already know about the activity packs for the children. Just don't forget to leave them back so that we can get them sorted for next week. Robert and Colin have reminded us that this Wednesday is the next collection for CAP. One or maybe both of them will be in the foyer between 6.30 and 7.30. That's Wednesday the 17th. So if you're wanting to donate, that's when you'll get them here. It has to be getting close to the deadline for putting your name on the barbecue list. I haven't heard when it closes, but it must be nearly ready to close. So if you haven't already done it, get your name on that list for the 28th of July at, at Green Island. Um, I had a, an email through the week from the Reverend uh, Stephen Woods about it. So you do really need to be getting your name if you're going. And don't forget the Family Fun Day. It's the 17th of August. And the basket is out there. If you want to donate something for the children's brand tub, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, during the week, we heard the sad news of the death of Anne Pryor last Sunday evening. Her funeral was held in Island McGee on Thursday. And of course, your prayers are requested. You know how important prayer is at all times but particularly whenever you have a, a death in the family. Um, as you already know, Reverend Andrew's covering for Adam. So if you have need of a, the services of a minister, please let Andrew know and he'll get things sorted for you. Um, I'll be away for the next two Sundays. So Robert has very kindly agreed to um, stand in. So if you have any announcements, if you would get them to him in good time. And these are all the announcements today, unless I have forgotten something. So if, you, if I have forgotten, if you let Robert know, he'll cover it next week. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, as usual, very good announcements. Um, there might be a wee bit more than what's normal because uh, we don't have the bulletins at the minute, but you did receive bulletins a few uh, weeks ago that covers a lot of what's happening during the summer. So please remember to pray for the different things that are on that, if you still have it. There's still some available on the table there. Good to see you this morning. Nice to have you with us. Pray that the Lord will bless us as we meet together in his name. And we come together to worship him. And we sing our opening hymn, which reminds us to be still in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is here. Let's uh, just be still and think of him and put our thoughts in him as we sing this hymn. Mm -hmm.
Now let's turn to God in prayer. Father, we are so grateful and thankful that you are indeed moving in this place. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds that we would hear and our ears that we would hear from you this morning that you would touch our lives and enable us to live as your children we would never grasp the whole truth about you not even a fraction of it but what we do see when we take time to look is enough to fill us with awe and wonder you are the Lord of all, the creator of the ends of the earth, the creator of the heavens and the skies, and the giver and sustainer of life. You are all good, loving and merciful. And you want to be involved in every moment of our lives and every moment of every day. Forgive us that we sometimes take that for granted. Forgive us that our hearts no longer thrill as they once did. Forgive us for growing so accustomed to you that we become careless in our relationship, losing our sense of reverence as we come to worship. Father, teach us that our minds can only begin to grasp your glory. At best, glimpsing a part of the truth, there's always more to be revealed, more to learn, more to catch our imagination and thrill our souls. Grant us then, as we worship you today, that your radiance may burst afresh into our lives so that we may return to the daily routine of everyday life, determined to love, know, and serve you better. May it all be to the glory of your name. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Your offering for the work of God in this place will now be received.
think we'll have that hymn next week. <laughs> Christ alone, cornerstone. Just such a lovely hymn, such lovely words in it, and just such a meaning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us, for how you have loved, your, loved us and cared for us and met our needs every day. We pray that you would take these, our gifts, that we offer to you this morning, that you would bless them and use them to your honour and glory and for the extension of your kingdom in this place. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A few weeks ago, um, Adam and I mentioned about the Methodist Conference. And we mentioned one of the things that was agreed at the Methodist Conference. Um, but we said that the Methodist Church are actually preparing a video uh, which will expand a little bit on other things that happened at the conference. And I was able to get the video and download it. And we're going to just show it now. So this will give you a flavour of what happened at the conference. Methodist Conference 2024 finished just a few days ago in Belfast. It was great to have representatives from... The Methodist Conference 2024 finished just a few days ago in Belfast. It was great to have representatives from across the whole connection together for worship, prayer, fellowship and to confer together regarding the mission of the church. The conference theme this year was for the transformation of the world, which I will focus on as president while travelling around the connection. This is the third part of the phrase, living wholeheartedly as followers of Jesus for the transformation of the world. One of the images I talked about at the installation service comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, which says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The clay jar was a common, everyday, ordinary object, fragile in nature, highly useful, easily breakable. Clay jars were often used to carry personal valuables. Paul was acknowledging his weakness, fragility and ordinariness, yet was carrying in himself this great treasure of the person and good news of Jesus. So it is for every follower of Jesus. The message of the cross is not something that's peripheral or external. We carry it in us because it's about God's work in us as ordinary people. We by ourselves cannot transform the world. We are to be the first transformed in Christ and then faithfully live for him. In my installation address, I shared a photo of myself as a child with my dad and commented on the look of delight on his face. It made me think of the look of love there must be on the Heavenly Father's face when we gather to worship him and how easy it is to miss the real reason for gathering on a Sunday morning. It's a poignant photo because two months later my father died. So my relationship with a loving dad stayed in that childhood context. We didn't get to journey together through life or deepen our relationship. John and I came at it from different angles, but we're both saying our relationship with God is the key to our service in the church. Hopefully your representatives to conference will be able to share their highlights of our four days together. But here are some of the headlines from our time together as we think about a world transformed through Jesus. Growing as a church has been a matter that the Connectional team have been grappling with over the past two years. Equipping and releasing leadership, listening and learning from places where growth is happening, and courageously planting new churches, missional communities, and kingdom-orientated social enterprises has to be our priority. Reaching the next generation of children and young people is a vital part of this. We must be a praying people, utterly dependent upon the guidance, power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. 
The Council on Social Responsibility continue to help keep our focus on social justice. This year, bringing reports on racial injustice and poverty. Sarah Stevens stressed the value of those arriving from other countries and the need for welcoming attitudes. Reverend Brian Anderson brought us startling figures of increased numbers needing to use food banks, often caused by delays in benefits payments. The new environmental policy brought to conference by CSR encourages good environmental stewardship by local churches with practical ideas for church councils to put in place. We took time to consider the Faith and Order Committee's report and resolution on human sexuality. The discussion was respectful and the variety of voices demonstrated the breadth of opinion which we hold within the Methodist Church in Ireland. We underlined some important things. First of all, that everyone is welcome to be a member of the Methodist Church in Ireland and to participate in the life of the Church. Conference did not change our understanding of the nature of marriage as between one man and one woman. Indeed, that was not even debated. Church councils have the responsibility of discerning the roles in which all members serve. Following discussion, we stated that adherence to that sexual ethic is the goal of discipleship and the standard for spiritual leadership and teaching roles in the life of the church. We stress the importance of maintaining those principles in a compassionate way. And as a church, we made an unreserved apology for any ways in which our words or actions or attitudes have fallen short of the way of Jesus. The Governance Board, whom conference tasks with being the charity trustees for the church, reported on their work. The Board oversees the church's financial processes and are responsible for a number of major reviews at the moment, including one of Minister's stipends and allowances and pensions, one of the scope, size and funding of connectional support services, and of our associated bodies. In doing this significant work on our behalf, they free local societies and circuits for mission and support them in that mission. We are well served by the Governance Board. As usual, we had the opportunity to celebrate with newly ordained ministers and commission new probationers. We highlighted the work of lay mission partners and we were delighted to have some of our pioneer mission workers with us. The suggested change in the term of office for the president from one year to three years on a part-time basis was not adopted. However, aspects from that report, which related to the role of the lay leader, were welcomed and were seen to reflect the importance our church places on the active involvement of lay people in ministry and mission. A working party will give further consideration to this during the coming year. Conference is finished for this year, but the work hasn't. You'll find lots of resources on the Irish Methodist website. The representatives have returned home, but hopefully inspired and motivated to serve and to encourage us all to be the first transformed for the transformation of the world. I hope that gives you a little flavour of what, what happened at that conference. It was a, obviously, it took four days, so at the, in a sort of seven, eight minute video, I can't relate to everything. We will have uh, our President, um, Reverend Dr. John Alderdice, uh, visiting with us in August, and no doubt here maybe refer to one or two things that uh, he thought were very relevant. And then I'll have our new lay leader, Elaine Barnett, uh, will be with us in September. So we'll maybe hear a little bit more about uh, conference and decisions are made and be encouraged in our journey as Christians to live wholeheartedly for him. As John said there, his theme for this year is uh, the transformation of the world. And no doubt he'll be encouraging us to think about ways that we can transform our world, maybe not the whole world, 
we can do it. We can do it maybe one person, one place at a, t- at a time. And here, no doubt, encourage us that way. Now, our prayers group are going to come and play for us.
I'm just doing the reading myself this week. It's just not a long week. It comes from Colossians chapter 1 and reading verses 24 to 29. And this is Paul writing to the church in Colossae. And this, so this is Paul, if you like, speaking. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body, which is the church. I have become its servants by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his majesty, mystery, and which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labour, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. We thank God for this reading from his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come grateful and thankful for the opportunities that come to allow us to be in church today, to worship you, to praise you, to hear from you, Help us to come close to you in our prayers and in our thoughts and in our actions. May you guide us in everything. Father, we ask that you would lead us each day by day as we seek to serve you in this world, to be the people that you want us to be, to shine as witnesses to those who need to know Jesus. And Lord, we pray for those who we know who do not know Jesus as Saviour and Lord, those who have not come to a saving faith in him yet, people who we know personally, maybe members of our families, maybe members of our clubs or organisations that we belong to, Maybe neighbours, maybe friends, maybe colleagues at work. So Lord, we pray for them. We pray that through our presence that we may be a light shining towards them that would draw them on to Jesus and on to salvation. We commit them to you particularly those who we really, really love. We pray for others who maybe have grown cold in their faith, who aren't shining for you as they once did. Their light has gone dim. They're maybe struggling because of something that has happened. And they are now questioning Questioning their faith, questioning you. And Lord, we pray that you would be close to them. We pray that you would renew their faith and help them to come back and help them to put their faith totally in you again and to trust you no matter what happens or what has happened. Lord, remember those who are ill belonging to our church. We lift them into your presence. We bring them before you and we pray that you would bless them, minister to them. And if it is your will, you put your healing hand upon them. But whatever, Lord, that you be close to them and that they will know you are there with them in their illness. Be with those who love them, who care about them, their lovely families, their friends. 
and be close to them too and support them as they worry and are concerned about their loved one. And Father, we also want to pray for those who have lost loved ones in recent days and we think that particularly, as has been mentioned this morning, the family and friends of Anne Pryor. Be with them, be their help and strength through a difficult time, a time of loss. Lord, be their comfort. And help them to know that as Anne had loved you and served you and that she's with you now, give, help them to have some comfort in that. And we pray for others who are known to us who have lost loved ones. And we lift them into your presence too and pray that you would comfort them as well. And we pray for our church. We pray that for your blessing on us as we seek in this incoming church year to serve you and minister to you. We ask your blessing on the different things that are planned for the summer, not just in our church but in, around the, the circuit as well. And we pray that you would just be there, minister, bless, guide and help through it all. So we pray for the activities over this, these summer months. We pray that you would be a great blessing and a challenge and an opportunity to reach out to the local community. We pray for Adam and Pam on holiday that you would refresh them and renew them. And Lord, we lift them to you and Etnam and pray you bring them safely back to us. And Lord, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again. Come let us sing of a wonderful love. The lorry driver was hauling a load of 10 penguins to the zoo. 
Unfortunately, his truck broke down. He eventually waved down another truck and offered the driver £200 to take the penguins to, on to the zoo. The next day, the first truck driver had got his truck fixed and was driving into town and he couldn't believe his eyes. Just ahead of him, he saw the second driver crossing the road and walking behind him were the ten penguins. He stopped and jumped out and went up to the guy and he says, What's going on? Didn't I give you £200 to take these penguins to the zoo? And the driver said, Yes, you did. And I took them to the zoo. And they had a great time. And we've, en <laughs> and we've enough money now to take them to the cinema. <laughs> the guy didn't know and didn't understand fully what he was supposed to be doing. And likewise, many believers today are fuzzy about their sense of purpose and why they are saved. In this section of Colossians, we discover Paul and other places as well, but in this section we discover our reason for living as a Christian. And this, these verses in Colossians, and indeed, going on into chapter 2 and further on, Paul answers the question, now, now that Jesus is in and supreme in my life, what is my purpose as a believer? And this passage gives us a number of statements from Paul that will help us to discover what we have been designed to do as followers of Christ here in Carrick Fergus this morning. And the first one might be a little strange. And it is, we are to suffer for the gospel. We may not expect that to be included in the list. But Paul, in verse 24, makes it clear that he saw suffering as a part of his job description for Christ. He says, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul willingly and joyfully suffered on behalf of the sake of the gospel. He says now, at the start of that. And it's not just a, a trans, trans, transition from what was before. Paul is rejoicing precisely in what he is suffering at that particular moment. Because Paul is in prison for the gospel as he's writing this letter. Many of us try to get rid of suffering when it comes our way. When we're in pain, we want to relieve it. Paul was different. He found joy in what he suffered. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 7 and verse 4, he says, In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. And he suffered far more than any of us ever will. Listen to what he writes in 2 Corinthians 11. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled, and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. Before Paul's conversion, 
he inflicted suffering on the believers. But since his conversion, he has suffered for the believers. Now let me be clear. Paul suffered for three reasons. At least three reasons. First, he suffered because of his relationship with Jesus Christ. Like many early believers, he was persecuted for his faith in Christ and for preaching the gospel. And secondly, he suffered because of the Gentiles. He suffered for them. Many in the, of the Jews were happy that the good news of Jesus was given to Jews, but they were unhappy because he was taking it to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles did not want to know. And many times he was beaten and put in prison for telling the good news to people. And he suffered for the sake of the body, the church. As the believers saw him and what he was going through, and it gave them courage to face persecution. When we are going through hard times, when we are going through difficult times, people may look at us and look at our faith and how we suffer can be a witness to them. How we take what is happening to us can be a witness to others. We need to keep rejoicing and praising God even in our suffering and in our hard times. But let me be clear here, he is not talking about illness. He's not talking about the suffering that we go through maybe on a daily or occasionally because of ill health. What he is talking about is persecution. Persecution because of faith in Christ. We need to rejoice and be thankful that we live in a country where we are more or less free of persecution for our faith. We need to remember our brothers and sisters in Christ who live in many countries around the world who are suffering even at this present time because they follow Jesus and because they put their faith in him. But we need to be careful we need to be careful because there are those around today who will make fun or laugh at us or make fun. I remember talking to a young man one day in church and he was a bit upset. And I asked him what was wrong. And he said, well, my friends are all going out to a party tonight and I've been excluded. And I said, why are you excluded? And he says, because I'm a Christian. They don't include me. It's all right when they want things from me, but when they're going out to have a good time, I'm left out. A little bit of persecution. We can think how people have had, and maybe not so much nowadays we hear about it, but how people may be wearing a cross or a fish in their lapel or something else have had to remove them because other people have objected to them. We don't have the persecution that many others suffer, but there's maybe a little bit of it. Often young people, and I know my, my own grandchildren, that people maybe laugh at them because they go to church. Their friends don't, and they make fun of them. And they call them goo-dooders. Do gooders. Get that, get that right. And then secondly, Paul encourages us to be servants. He says he is a servant. I have become a servant, that is a gospel servant, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among you, the Gentiles, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you the hope of glory. As Paul likes to do often in the scriptures, he refers to himself as a servant. Since Jesus was supreme in his life, 
Paul was fully devoted to him wholeheartedly. That's the word we hear a lot about. We heard about it in the video. Living wholeheartedly for God. He's, but he wants us to live wholeheartedly as followers of Christ. His task was to present the word of God in its fullness. Paul was a servant and his calling was to make fully known the gospel of Jesus, the word of God. I recognize my responsibility to preach the gospel, to preach the word of God in its fullness. I won't shrink away from communicating the Bible. Someone said that a pastor's job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfort. That sounds like something Apostle Paul would agree with. To afflict, to comfort the afflicted, and to afflict the comfortable. One of my favorite things as a minister was to watch people grow in their faith, to watch people become more and more like Christ, and to watch people discover how they can serve Christ in the world. In the two churches, the last two churches of which I've been minister in um, Rathco and in Finnecke, I ran a course called a shape course. Now, if you look around the church, you will look at us and you'll see we're all different shapes. And I'm not going to make any comment on what shapes we are, but just look, we look around. I'll put it this way, some are tall, some aren't so tall, some are, no, I'll let it go at that. I could get into trouble very easy about this. So good. But the shape course, I've maybe mentioned it before in church, helped people to learn about their spiritual gifts. That's the S. And discover what gifts they have that have been given to them from God. And then the H is heart. Things that we love. Things that we are passionate about. Things that mean a lot to us. And they help to shape who we are. And A stands for abilities, like natural abilities, like some people are naturally talented, like Donald and the piano there in the organ. There are other people who are naturally talented at music. Some people are naturally talented uh, at art. Other people maybe have, can sing beautiful, beautifully, and other people like me are struggle along. We've all got different gifts and have different abilities. And it's about using those abilities that we have for God. And then the P stands for personality. We're all different personalities. Some people are introverted, some people are extroverted. Some people, most people probably are somewhere in between. But the course helps people to learn what their personality is and how they can use their personality. For Christ. Some people can go into a room and talk away. I have a friend in the ministry, in the English ministry, well, he's well, actually retired now, but um, when he was in the ministry, he could just sit down with somebody in a plane and start talking about his faith. No bother at all to him. He was just a very outgoing, charismatic type of person. He could sit beside, meet somebody in a bus stop, and by the time the bus came, the person had been converted. I'm afraid that's not my personality. I couldn't do that. But he could, with different personalities. And E stands for experience. We all go through different experiences. I remember when I worked in the bank, it was going through a difficult time one time, and um, I learned through it to trust in God and put my faith totally in God. A few years later, a young man came to me and he said about the hard time he was having in at work that his manager was always picking on him. And I was able to share what I had gone through and how I coped with it to help him to cope with it as well. Are we serving as God has called us, as God wants us? If you're not, you don't know what you're missing. In my last church, we had small groups. And one of the small groups, uh, house groups, met and did a, a video study called On the Front Line. 
It helped people to recognize where their front line was. That might be in work or at home or friends, family, whatever, front line. This girl really felt, well, what's my front line? She thought, prayed about it, and she felt it was where she worked, the office she worked in. And she thought, now, how can I be a witness in this office? You're not allowed to openly talk about your faith. You'd get into trouble if you did. So she prayed about it. One day she was, now I can't remember exactly what's happened here, she was either going upstairs or coming downstairs and a person going, a man going the other direction and they actually bumped into each other, literally bumped into each other. And of course they started apologizing to each other and talking to each other and whatever way they were talking, it came clear that they were both Christians. So they decided they would meet at lunchtime and chat about their faith. So they did. And he knew a couple of other Christians who were in that office, and he invited them along too. So every day they used to meet at lunch and have their lunch together in the lunchroom and talk about their faith. A few more people joined them when they saw what they were doing. They would have looked at the Bible and studied the Bible together. And as people got used to this and saw this, people were coming up to them and asking them to pray for something. Even those who would not have been Christians would have been saying, could you pray for my mother who's sick or something like that? And so she got, that witness became a, a thing in that office. And not just for her, but for others. And she used the gifts that she had to share the good news of Jesus. And thirdly, and I'll move on quickly because I'm looking at the clock. Paul says, We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all witness, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Paul shifts back to we in this verse to let them know that he and Epaphras, who was with him, were proclaiming the good news and the false teachers were not. We proclaim Christ. This is exactly what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. When we talk to others about our faith, we must always focus on Jesus and not on us. When we talk to others about what Jesus has done for us, we don't do it to glorify ourselves, but to glorify him. And in verse 28, he uses the word everyone. And it's not just for some people. It's for everyone to do. We need to, at times, maybe correct people, but other times, teach people. Create communication of the word of God. Jesus left us this responsibility before he ascended into heaven after he had risen. He said that we, as followers of him, as his disciples, we were to teach and this disciples to obey everything he has commanded. We need to look for opportunities to serve and make sure we take advantage of them. And our focus must not be just on numerical growth but on spiritual growth. We want to see people being built up in their faith. In Rathco we had a Clearing Our Vision program which no longer exists, by the way. And it helped us to focus on what our, our purpose of our church was. And we said that the purpose of the church is to make disciples, to make disciples, to bring people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, to build them up in their faith, and to enable them to serve. And that became the purpose of our church. And every organization, every activity that went on in that building was to do just that. We need to do that. We as his followers need to be willing to serve, to give our all for him, and to share the good news of Jesus Christ to those who need to hear it. We are his witnesses. 
Jesus, before he ascended, said that, and it's in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, for when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit. We're not on our own when it comes to serving. We're not on our own when it comes to telling other people about Jesus or living the Christian faith because God's Holy Spirit living within us will give us the power. The word that's used there is dynamis, which is a word that's used for dynamite, which is a sense of power, an explosive power, and it's there for every one of us as long as we open our hearts and rely on it and ask God to help us to live for him and to serve him in this world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, help us to walk the journey to which you have called us, keeping faith in your saving power. When we grow weary, revive us. When we go astray, direct us. When we lose heart, inspire us. And when we turn back, reprove us. Keep us traveling onwards, trusting in your guidance. And help us to be certain that you will be there at our journey's end to welcome us home into your eternal kingdom with the words, Welcome, good and faithful servant. And in your name we ask it. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, Jesus is the name we honour.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and evermore. Amen. <laughs>